are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Daily Racing Forum webinar about using Timeform USPPs. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital. Really excited to be launching what I think I can say without hyperbole is a new era in handicapping, incorporating the uh, terrific work done by our friends at Timeform US with the Daily Racing Forum PPs that you already know and love. And we've got a great team put together for this call. It's going to take place over the next hour. Uh, and our special guest is Craig Milkowski. Craig is the chief figure maker for Timeform US. How are you doing today, Craig? I'm doing great. A little cold here in Oklahoma City, but otherwise good. Hey, we can relate to that up here uh, where I am in my bunker in Brooklyn. The winds are blowing cold while out walking the dog this morning. We also have on the call the DRF Director of Product Marketing. You may also know him along with me as the, one of the co-hosts of the DRF Players podcast. From the DRF offices in New York, we have Mike Hogan. Hello, Pete. Hello, Craig. Welcome. This, is, uh, this will be a fun one. So what we're going to do today, there's so much ground to cover. We're not going to try to tell you every intricacy of the Timeform USPPs in an hour. That would not be possible. But we are going to talk about some of the similarities and differences between DRF and Timeform. We're going to go over what makes the Timeform US speed figures and pace figures special. We're going to go over the edge Timeform US can potentially give you when you're looking at foreign horses. We're going to have a question and answer session, and Mike will now demonstrate through the webinar tool how you can submit a question while you're watching. We're going to try to leave some time at the end for, for questions. If not, we can get to them subsequently, or you can always hit us up with questions we don't get to on Twitter. We'll do a quick run of the Twitter handles. Craig, what is yours again? I, I follow you, but I don't know it off the top of my head. It is Timeform US Figs, F-I-G-S. And then Mike can be reached at DRF Hogan, and I can be found at Looms Boldly. But hopefully we'll be able to get to plenty of those questions during the show here. We also have, as a special offer for webinar attendees, a chance to try the Timeform PPs at a discounted price. Mike Hogan will be getting to that later in the show. But before we really dive in, Craig, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your background. This is something we always do with our new guests on the DRF podcast. We find it's helpful for uh, listeners, viewers, to get a little bit of a sense of who the people are who we're talking to on the show. What is your background and how did you get involved in this uh, quixotic pursuit of being a figure maker? Uh, well, I actually got my introduction to horse racing back in high school. I was uh, good friends, or remain good friends, with uh, Larry Comas, who I'm sure most sure. of our panelists know. Uh, he introduced me to the game way back then and Made a lot of trips to Charlestown. I think my first trip was actually to Bowie with Larry, and I was hooked ever since. Uh, we obviously took different paths. He wound up being an announcer, and uh, I entered the Air Force, where I remained for 23 years. And over in that time uh, is when I kind of was able to find the time to keep up with my hobby and hopefully get better at it over the years. Started making speed figures. Was a uh, a big fan of Andy Byer. Read, I've probably read everything he's ever written, books, columns, uh, many more than once. Uh, so still remain a huge fan of Andy's and, and give a lot of credit to him for all the stuff I've learned over the years. And you know, that's it. Just since I retired, uh, actually while I was still in the Air Force, I started a website, PaceFigures.com, just as a hobby. And people really seemed to like it and almost were begging me, not begging, but asking, hey, sell, <laughs> sell us your stuff. So I kind of started, and it took off from there, and, and that's how uh, Timeform US found out about me, and you know the rest is kind of history. Fantastic stuff. I want to start with a basic question about using speed figures to handicap, um, and it's a question that I, I have my own answer to, but I'm curious what either of you uh, gentlemen will have to say about it. I find it very beneficial to have more than one set of speed figures when I'm doing my race analysis and handicapping. Craig, for you, is that something that's important or that at any point during your handicapping career you've, you've looked at? Yeah, there's been times when I've looked at, at different sets of speed figures for sure. Uh, I know Mike and I have had some, some offline discussions about the 
some of the difficulties today in making figures with, with so many turf races, so many maiden races. So, you know, as much as I'd like to say my figures are perfect, they're not, as are no one. So I think if you're looking at buyers and mine and you see they kind of relate, you can have even more confidence in a horse that the figure's accurate. And, and when there's a big difference, you can look at them and say, hey, there's probably some issues going on there that made these figures a little tough. I think that's a great point. You can use a discrepancy when you're looking at multiple sets of figures to do a little bit of a deeper dive yourself and try to ascertain why those figures might be different. For me, doing that type of analysis just gives me a deeper understanding of what's going on on my circuit and almost acts as a substitute for the need to make figures of my own. I know uh, some professional horse players still go through that exercise and they talk about how making figures is beneficial not only to have the information that you get but also because by going through the process you just understand what's going on on the racetrack a little bit more I feel like uh, as a shortcut more for a weekend warrior type player or a horse player who doesn't have time to make their own figures looking at multiple figures and figuring out why they're different why they're the same that's going to give them a lot of that same knowledge in my uh, in my estimation and it's one of the reasons why for some time now I've been looking at time form USPPs. I mean, I wouldn't uh, dream of betting a race where I didn't look at uh, what Andy Beyer had to say from a figure point of view. And for me, the DRF is still what I print out and where I ground my handicapping. But I wouldn't feel confident uh, in making a bet unless I was also taking a look at what uh, the time form US data has to say. And maybe that's a good opportunity, Craig, for us to just talk about the differences between the buyer figures and the figures that, that you create. What do you see as the biggest difference in your approach from what Andy's doing? Uh, well, the, the biggest difference people are going to notice right away is the scale is different. Our, our figures are definitely higher. Uh, our scale is aligned with the time form from England scale, the one that you see for foreign horses that ship over. And we did that for a very specific reason. Uh, our figures are made so that when horses ship overseas, you can make a direct comparison to the time form ratings and the time form U.S. speed figures and know that you're looking at the same scale. And uh, as you see, you've used our figures before on days like the Breeders' Cup and, and plenty of turf races where horses ship in from overseas, I mean, I think it's an invaluable asset to have. Uh, what, uh, I would say a typical grade one race for older males on time form US is going to be in the upper 120s, whereas in buyer, uh, I would guess it's probably about 110 these days, uh, and they max out probably around 120 or so, uh, where we've had as high as 140. So that, that's pretty much the difference there uh, on the scale. Some other things are that our overall figures include some pace adjustments, where if the pace is slow or the pace is fast, depending on the surface and distance, it can have an effect, whereas buyer speed figures are, are based on the final time. Ours kind of look at the pace and the final time uh, as it relates to the distance and surface. Definitely that's a, a cool perspective that can change the way you look at a race at a glance. It creates a, a dynamic where you could potentially have a second place horse earn a higher figure than the winner. One example that leaps to mind would be uh, not this year but the previous year's Whitney Stakes with uh, Liam's map and honor code with Liam's map cutting out those crazy fractions and uh, doing more of the dirty work honor code running a huge race himself but if I'm not mistaken Craig on your figure scale in that scenario uh, Liam's map would have earned a higher final figure than, than honor code did is that is that right yeah, that's exactly right. He definitely did, and uh, luckily in that case, he kind of backed it up next out, I believe, in the, the Breeders' Cup third mile, uh, whereas Honor Code didn't run so well, and uh, I'm sure he took a hit. Deep closers uh, usually get, get penalized a little bit on our figures because uh, the pace figures are always slow. Now, granted, for deep closers, we, we it doesn't count as much like a front runner would, but uh, I've seen races where the fourth place finisher has gotten a better figure. There. I can't remember the exact race. There was a uh, New York bred two-year-old filly race just a week or so ago where it was just a crazy fast pace and, and the, the top horses collapsed. And I'm sure the fourth place finisher got a much higher figure than the winner even. So tell me about the theory of incorporating pace into 
the final figure. And also, I, uh, we should probably mention to folks that you can also look at the time form U.S. figures with the pace stripped out and look at sort of a raw final figure more along the lines of, uh, of what you see in a buyer speed figure. But before we uh, get to that or show that specifically on the screens, I'd love to hear a little more about the why of incorporating that pace uh, information into the number, Craig. Well, this was just one of the things I started doing back with pacefigures.com, and it was just kind of a shortcut to the handicapping because I was doing it in my head anyway, where you know, a horse would have such and such pace figure, and he doled for the lead and kind of backed up. And his final time figure maybe was an 80, but he ran a pace figure of 100. And, you know, in my head, I'd say, well, this was probably more of a 90-type performance. And, and that's what, we, what I strove to, to convey with one number was what really happened, who was the best horse in this race. And uh, we, you know, we've done some studies at Time Form U.S., and, and you know, sometimes people question the adjustments, but the horses with the highest adjustments actually show the best R ROI among those, those uh, horses with the best figures. So I think we're going down the right path. But I also learned from experience that surface and distance matter. Uh, you know, a mile and a quarter dirt race, if you're going too fast early, it could just as easily be the, that the horse can't raid or doesn't want the distance. So we kind of temper those adjustments as the distances get longer. And on turf, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, necessarily having a lot of early speed isn't always a big weapon. So we temper the adjustments there as well. Sounds like there's been some trial and error and some adjusting of algorithms along the way, a constantly evolving process. Is it right to describe it like that? It is. It's been pretty static for a while now. Where I'm happy where we're at, though. I'm kind of always looking to, to make sure things are good. I'm always studying my database in my free time, uh, much to my wife's dismay. But you know, <laughs> Usman's holiday. What are you doing tonight, Craig? I'm going to study my database. So I'm sure that's not, not necessarily the biggest hit at home. No, no, it generally isn't. But, but yeah, it did take a lot of trial and error, as you say, in the beginning, and I actually had a lot of customers provide feedback. I had a very interactive group who most of them have come, come along to Timeform US, so that's a really good thing there, and they helped me out a lot as well. Folks, the, what, the idea I'm getting here for folks listening, you know, Craig's doing the work so you don't have to, and I think that in a way gets to a little bit of the ethos of some of what is going on when you're looking at Timeform US in general. We're looking at ways to simplify handicapping at a glance, save you time as the end user. You still have the ability to dive as deep as you want, but in other instances, you have a chance to get some information at a little bit more of a glance. Again, not necessarily to replace anything you're doing anyway, but in certain situations, I think of tournament players, um, in a hurry event like the NHC trying to look at a lot of races maybe having some of that work cut out for you is just going to make your life easier and free you up to focus on other aspects of your horse playing that uh, where you need to do the heavy lifting yourself why not let someone like Craig uh, do some of the heavy lifting when it comes to uh, when it comes to the figure making it certainly makes sense to me um, another aspect of pace that I use all the time when it comes to the time form figures is helping me design races in my head. Uh, and, and I'm, of course, talking here about the, the pace projector and how you use your pace figures, Craig, to, to uh, demonstrate at least a theory of how a race is going to be run. I'd love to hear you talk about uh, how the pace projector came to be and what your involvement in it and the role that your figs play in, in making it the tool that it is. Well, the pace projector is based on the early speed ratings that I make for each horse. That they also go back, go back to the pace figure days. And uh, they're based on how fast the horse runs a half mile in, in each of its races. It doesn't matter if it's a mile and a half turf race or if it's a uh, you know five furlong sprint on the dirt. We look at how fast was this horse after a half mile. And the reason I do that is because every race has a call at the half mile. So it's you know kind of interchangeable. And uh, one thing people will get a little confused about is they'll see a big pace figure at a mile and a half, and you know it might be 150, and it's only a 49 half mile, and they'll see 100 on the dirt when it was 44. But what we also do is we convert those uh, pace figures into an actual adjusted time, and that is what the pace the pace projector is based on: is how fast these horses actually were traveling. 
And uh, it looks at the last five races. I know we had a few discussions about this. Uh, some count more than others. Uh, we look at not just how fast the horse ran, but where they were positioned in the race. Uh, because obviously whether a horse is faster, you know, depend, forgetting the raw velocity, some horses just go to the lead no matter what it takes. They'll go as fast as they have to or as slow as they need to. Uh, others will never take the lead. They can run huge pace figures in fourth, put them in a different field that goes much slower, and they're going to be fourth. So we look at the velocity, we look at the position of the horses, and we base you know those on the distance of the races they've run. We base them on the uh, the surface they've run on because obviously paces are slower on turf and on synthetics than on dirt. And it all it, you know it's a little complicated. I, I couldn't explain it all, but that's pretty much the gist of it here. Mike, let's take a look at the pace projector within the time form USPPs. I don't know if we want to just click on it from where you are. If you want to back out and show folks, uh, some folks watching here probably have not seen the US time form USPPs. We could show them how to access a race quickly, perhaps, and then and then leap into that, whichever, whichever you think is best. Yeah, we can we can start with this one because uh, I'll use the race finder to to uh, focus on a, a race coming up on Saturday. Uh, but I know Craig wanted to look at a couple races today at Gulfstream Park because there are a couple interesting pace scenarios in the eighth and the ninth race there. And maybe what I'll do is I'll start, I kind of showed it a little bit, uh, but I'll start by showing the DRF PPs, which are probably going to be more familiar uh, to most of the people watching, especially those that haven't used the Timeform US PPs. You'll see those buyer speed figures to the left of the running lines. You'll see the comment lines. Uh, you'll see a lot of the stuff that you've been familiar with for years. Uh, so one of the biggest differences between uh, the DRF PPs and the time form US PPs, at least on screen, you're not able to see more than one horse at a time. So you have to toggle through either on your computer or on your, your tablet uh, to look at each horse individually. Uh, so there's that. And then, as you mentioned, the pace projector right here, if you click on that, it brings up details on how Craig and his team see the race uh, developing. And Craig, why don't you talk a little bit about this eighth at Gulfstream today where there's uh, projected to be a fast pace. Yeah, you'll notice uh, one, one of the things we look at is uh, we also assign a running style to each horse based on how they've run in the past. We call them either leader, who basically always leads, speed who often leads and you have pressers and or I think we call them trackers, uh, mid-pack, closer, deep closer and, and based on the makeup of the field uh, and how close they are together like if you have three speed horses and one has an early speed rating of 100 and the other two are 60 uh, it's probably not going to be projected, projected as a fast pace because one will control it. But what we do is we look at those ratings, we look at the running styles, and we have some algorithms in place that will indicate whether the horse, whether we expect a fast pace or a slow pace. Uh, the slow pace is in blue. The fat, uh, race eight here is in red. When you click on see details, you'll see fast pace. Uh, one of the differences you'll see for the red, we show fast pace, where the blue we show favors on or near the early lead. Uh, the reason we kind of went away from saying favors closers in the red is because American racing just doesn't work that way. Sure. They actually yeah. talked about it. Even when the pace is fast, oftentimes you don't get a closer winning the race. But we're just trying to tell you, hey, there's plenty of speed in this race. Uh, don't expect somebody to steal it. You know, and maybe closers have a shot here. Oh, it makes sense to talk about a time-saving tool. You're in a tournament situation or you're a pace-oriented handicapper to have uh, at the, to quickly be able to see which races might present those type of pace scenarios that's just going to save you an awful lot of time over being able to to dig and do that work yourself let's talk a little more specifically about this race Craig and what you see how you uh, look maybe take a quick look back at that pace projector and, and then take a look at how you'll use that information to uh, to try to find a horse you think we might be able to uh, have a bet on here. You mentioned fast pace doesn't necessarily mean favors closers, but I certainly would uh, assume just from my time looking at your figures, Craig, it does tell me that the horse I'm looking for to win in most instances is going to have to be able to have some finish at the very least. Yes, definitely. That, that's a very good point. I wouldn't, for example, the one in there, we kind of show him as a tracker. 
Uh, if you look at the preview page, uh, that's where you can see the running style for every horse in one position with uh, his early speed and his late speed rating. And the first thing that jumps out at me, I mean, he's three to one morning line, yet he only has a uh, late speed rating of a 35. Compared to, so there's a whole bunch of 70s. There's even a 90 from the, the turf horse, uh, the three in here. Uh, so he's a horse I, w I would toss out right away. I, he's not a horse I'd be interested in betting at a short price. I didn't get much of a speed figure for me anyway. It doesn't really fit, but you know maybe the morning line won't be accurate. But that that's just right away a horse I'm going to say, hey, this race has some value because that one is is the morning line favorite, and everything looks against him to me. That's a great point. Now, when you're looking through, one one cool thing about the Time Form USPP is this color coding that you see in here uh, in this overview screen. You can see that the the brown colored squares that that's indicating figures that were derived from dirt races, blue for synthetic, and green for turf. Obviously, I mean, it seems obvious to me anyway, Craig, tell me if I'm wrong, you're going to want to take those figures more seriously when they were earned on the surface of today's race. Yes, absolutely, and that, that's a big part of it. We don't The spotlight rating where you see the one number there, it's just kind of a rating we're pointing at that, hey, this is the horse's best race in his last, I think it's five races and it's somewhat close to today's conditions at least. Uh, I got have to let me look at the three here for a second why his 91 was picked. Yeah, he's run on nothing but turf. So that's just his best figure out, out of his last five races. So, you know, I'd be a little leery. I'd, I'd have to go back and look and see how he's done on dirt. We do have lifetime past performances. You can scroll all the way to the bottom really quick. And uh, he's actually a horse who's run you know, about the same on dirt at times as he has on turf. So maybe at a price he'd be interesting. So right, that's smart to do that extra little deeper dive, the, the sort of number at a glance there, you can then take a look at other factors and, and determine how seriously you want to take that or not. Am I correct in saying that that spotlight rating, it almost sounds to me like when you hear um, pace handicappers who are familiar with the Sarton methodology or big fans like I am of Tom Brohammer, what you'd call a pace line. They're trying to find an effort representative of today's race. Is it, is it, is, is it the same concept for you, Craig, or is it a little bit different? Yeah, I'd say it's a little bit different. Same basic concept, but we're, we're just trying to highlight a race that we feel is closest to today's condition. And those numbers that you see on the other side of running style, how do those, how do those relate to the spotlight number, and are they chosen in the same manner? Uh, they don't. The uh, the one next to the running style where it says, like, say, for the one horse that shows tracker and has 79, the 79 is the early speed rating and the 35 is the late speed rating. The 79 is what's directly plotted onto the pace projector, and you can visually see that one. Uh, what, you know, horses, that is, and except in the case of maybe if a horse is adding blinkers, we might tinker with the pace projector a little bit. As a couple little adjustments, but for the most part, the early speed rating is the pace projector. Where does it come from, though? Is it derived from one of the last five races that today is sim somewhat similar to today's conditions, or is it a more complicated algorithm based on a horse's body of work? We, uh, just curious. Right. That, the early and late speed ratings are based on all of the last five races. They're kind of a whole body of work thing, as you say. Uh, so if a horse is in the dirt today and he's, he's shown a bunch of his last five races have been at a mile and an eighth on the turf or a mile and a quarter. He's always going to have a very low early speed rating. Uh, it, it, all the last five races always count. Uh, that's probably not perfect, but for an automated system, that, that's about the best we can do right now. Yeah, again, it's, the idea is to save you time, not to say, oh, we're not going to do this, this deeper dive into the, the PPs, but, but to be able to give you something at a glance, I just find it amazingly time-saving. I'm not necessarily going to, uh, if it's a race I'm interested in betting a lot of money in, I'm not necessarily going to just take the pace projector blind, but that's, um, I feel like I'm starting my race at the, at the quarter pole, and then I can go back in and maybe make some personal refinements I have for a pet jockey I know is a sender for a horse that I know something about their form cycle that maybe they're going to run differently today. But see, I can, that can then become fine-tuning using the pace projector as a basis as opposed to having to do all the work from scratch and taking several times uh, a factor longer to do. That's, that's 
for me what the, the real benefit of the pace projector is. It's not to replace doing that type of work, it's to make it a lot faster. It, it sounds right, from, that's a great yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, it's a great starting point. That's exactly what I've been telling people for years. Uh, as far, TVG often takes this and puts it on air and they'll have their hosts move it around to what they think and you know, sometimes people thought that would offend me, and it doesn't at all because I do the same exact thing at home myself. You know, That's I wish I had their little graphic where I could move it around, but, uh, you know, because I don't always agree. Like you said, we saw a horse we talked about yesterday who has showed speed twice since he was a first-time gelding, but his other three ratings were had kind of brought his early speed number down, and that was one I would happily push forward. No, that makes sense. You talked about automated, how the system is automated. How about the picks that you see, uh, Mike, if you go back to that, to, the, to that other screen we were looking at, the, the, I guess it's called the race preview screen, you see here these power picks. Um, I assume those are computer generated. Is it, what's the relationship between those picks and the other information we've been talking about, Craig, with the spotlight and the running style ratings? Uh, those are kind of the, they simulate what Timeform does, but if you watch any Timeform broadcast or if you see, you know, on TVG, do they, they do their one, two, three picks. It's just part of their thing where they always give three picks for each race. So, you know, we kind of emulated them here and we do the same thing. And they're based largely on the speed figures, the spotlight figure, a little bit on the pace projector. Uh, and I think that's, I'm not an expert on, on how exactly they're derived. But I will say I kind of use those as a, as a starting point. If there's a horse I wasn't interested in that pops up in the top three, I'll definitely give it a second look and you know and consider using the horse. And, and sometimes I won't, but it's just another starting point. You know, some people pick their contenders and, and scratch the rest off. I'll kind of start by looking at these, especially if I see a price horse in there. Let me ask you another question about the pace projector, this great uh, data visualization tool. You, you mentioned that it's looking at the, every race at the half mile. Um, that's a little bit different, I, I, I think, than the, the Brohammer uh, Sarton way of looking at the world, where they'd want to be looking at uh, trying to design the race to the pace call, which would be uh, the half mile in sprints and, and six furlongs in routes. So just go over again for me which part of the race this pace projector is trying to uh, demonstrate at both sprints and routes. Well, we're a quarter mile ahead of that, uh, what you mentioned. In sprints, we're, we're predicting what the first quarter is going to be. I mentioned that we look at the half-mile times, but when we look at position and running style, we're always looking at the uh, first call. So okay. two furlongs for sprints, four furlongs for routes. And that's what we try to show in the pace projector. We try to show this is where the, in the sprints it's a quarter mile, and anything a mile or longer is at the half-mile. Gotcha. Anything else specific we want to look at at this eighth at Gulfstream? We already demonstrated the, the potential weak favorite to bet against. Any positives to highlight, or should we uh, move along to the next race we wanted to look at? Yeah, I am actually a little with the three horse at 10 to 1. Uh, he's a horse a lot of people would dismiss right away. But uh, there's some things I do like about him, especially at that 10 to 1. Like I said, if you look back, he came off a, a long layoff, which is annotated by a, a bold red line and our running lines. And he ran a 65 and a 68 speed figure on dirt. And then he moved the turf, and he, although his finish position improved, he ran third. He still only ran a 70. Uh, and then he, you know, he basically has moved back to turf. But, you know, I don't see any reason to think he can't duplicate his turf numbers on dirt because he's done it before. So he's also claimed by a better trainer. Uh, he goes a trainer we have rated as a 73, which I don't know if we'll talk about those or not, but it's on a 0 to 100 scale. He was claimed away from a guy who's only rated a 42. So he's a horse I'll definitely be keeping an eye on if he's near his money line. Morning. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. One thing I'm really interested in in your trainer ratings is the idea that they're not based on wins and losses, but based on figures. Talk about that a little bit, Craig, if you will, what the, what the theory behind that is. Uh, you know, I don't. I think they are somewhat based on win percentage, but they're also based on ROI. I don't. I think with the breeding ratings, we're looking at speed figures. I don't think that's true for trainer ratings, but don't quote me on that. Uh, I'll, I'll post something on Twitter after I read through our FAQs again uh, on the Timeform US site. I'm pretty sure that speed figures don't come into play with those. It's just an. It's the kind of combined win percentage, not just win, but win place show. 
you know, how well do the horses run and what's the ROI. We'll and have other one number. As time goes on here, we'll have other opportunities to dive deeper into these. I just wanted to ask about that since we were talking about it. But again, the idea is at a glance, let's have a one number uh, that suggests if this is going to be a positive trainer move, a negative trainer move. Another thing I have to ask you about as we're looking at these PPs, something you'll notice uh, different than the DRF PPs we were looking at before, these numbers in the running line, the pace figures in the running line that are color-coded, but before we talk about the color coding, let's just talk about the numbers themselves, Craig. What, what, are, these, what are these numbers demonstrating exactly? Uh, just taking, for example, this uh, November 25th race at Gulfstream Park West. Okay, uh, which horse are we talking? The oh, I'm sorry. Screen. I thought you were looking at the same screen as I was. Run, Alex, run. Oh, yeah, okay, I am. I'm looking at the same. Okay, uh, he's a good horse to look at because uh, we see some red and we see some blue. In the last race, you see his uh, first two pace figures, which are 70 and 74, are in blue. And uh, what that's telling you is that it was a slow pace for that race. Uh, let me, uh, I'm looking at my own PPs here. Let me see what you're looking Okay, you have it set for the horse figures. That is something that can change, uh, just so people listening know that. Uh, you're showing 56 and 66. I have mine set to show the actual figures for the leader and the winner of the race as opposed to the horse itself. Oh, but that similar is similar to Formulator thing. where you can, you can change the, the splits that you're looking at to either be leader, winner, or you can look at the, at the individual horse. Mike here has it set to looking at the individual horse. Exactly. It's user preference, whatever you like. I happen to like looking at the race figure and then just the overall. But uh, the blue is telling you that for that race, uh, I believe the race figure was a, a 70 at the quarter and a 74 at the, the half, and the final time figure was an 83. And that tells me that for that race, it was a slow pace, so horses on or near the lead probably did well. It's almost like an after-the-fact pace projector. If you see it in blue, we're saying, hey, this, this race probably wasn't too good for closers, and you can see that with the three horse, who was three to one, and he kind of was in the back of the pack, got shuffled, and, and didn't really have much chance. Uh, the race below that, you will, you will note at a higher class where he, the figures are in red, uh, and that tells you the pace was hot that day, and it probably favored horses coming from off the pace. And if you ever want to know exactly what happened, all you have to do is click on the top three horses in each race, and it will open up a, a new window that shows you the chart for the race, complete with the figures. And yeah, I do that all the time. I probably do that 100 times a day. You know, I look at the figures, but I want to see actually what happened at the chart, uh, in the chart, and get a good look and kind of get a sense for it. Now, there you can see making sense, actually, even despite the fast pace was up close to the lead and still hung on. So. Yeah, it's and, a good and we can see, let's keep it in the chart view for a second. You can see here, this number, uh, hold it steady there, Mike, so we can go over one of these. Let's actually start with the winner there, Tis Madness. For, for, folks, who, um, for folks who aren't as familiar with uh, pace figures in general, the numbers going across the screen, they're representing what exactly? Is that, uh, the, that we're looking at making sense now, number 11. That 116, is that, that's the figure earned from the start to the second furlong, is that correct? Yes, that is to the two furlong call, and the next one, the 118, is to two furlongs. And they're cumulative, they're not incremental, so the 118 is for the first half mile, not for the second segment, the two furlongs to, to the half mile. It's cumulative all the way across. And then the 96 we see all the way, that is the raw speed figure. That would be the, uh, the equivalent to the way uh, 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 the buyer speed figure final time. It would not be the 100. The 100 that you see there in green, that's pace adjusted. The 96 is the final figure. Is that the that kind Exactly. Of the yeah, we call that at Timeform US our pace juice. Somebody came up with that. So that <laughs> horse got four, four points worth for that effort. And if you click on that, that little gray arrow next to the 100, you can actually scroll through and see what the horse did next time out. You can see he oh, ran, 100, uh, ran a 97, even though he ran 10th. And uh, if you click on that, it'll open the chart for that race. It's kind of a never-ending uh, rabbit hole. So we talked yeah, about Yeah, I can, I can spend hours in there. <laughs> 
that's great. But yeah, it's uh, and that's and that same information we were looking in the chart view. But Mike, if you go back to the PPs, we can see that the the same information is available for each of a horse's lifetime performances. Gives you a real opportunity to uh, to figure out what's going on from a for a pace point of view within the running lines of each horse in each race, which obviously uh, for pace oriented handicappers is is invaluable stuff. I mean, Mike, we've talked a lot on the podcast about the Moss pace figures that are within Formulator. My view with pace figures, not unlike uh, what I was saying at the top of the show about speed figures, is I love getting multiple opinions when it comes to figure making. For, for you, Mike Hogan, how do you use uh, the Moss pace figures? Do you use them the same way that Craig is describing for the time form figures? Is there anything you'd want to add or, or compare and contrast when talking about the, the Moss product versus what the extra stuff you get with the time form PPs? Yeah, absolutely. I, I use them very similarly to how Craig is describing them. I'll, I'll take a look at uh, the one set of figures and then look at the other set of figures, and if they match, then then like Craig was saying with, with his final speed figures versus the buyer speed figures, well then you, you generally know, yes, that that was a very strong early pace or that was a very slow early pace. And sometimes there might be a little bit of discrepancy, you know, and, and, and some of that may be due to human error. Sometimes there's a, a timing error. Sometimes there's no timing uh, for some of the early fractions. I'm, Craig, I'm sure, Craig, you've had to deal with that quite a bit in the last uh, year or so. You, the timer malfunctions, things like that, um, you, you kind of have to use, neither one is a silver bullet, neither one is one that you want to go with over the other per se, but but in using them together, it just gives you much more information and makes you a better handicapper and gives you a better sense of, of what pace means and, and how it's likely to affect today's race. That's actually something that I wanted to ask Craig about. I'm, one of the many reasons you're such a good follow on Twitter is how attuned you are to the timer malfunctions and these the challenges, I'm sure, especially when it comes to making pace figures in turf races where the timer sometimes seems just so obviously to be not functioning or malfunctioning. How do you do that? Do you, how do you go about making pace figures when the source data is unreliable? Well, it's uh, actually, you know, I, I have profile set up for every single configuration that every track runs, whether it's a different rail setting or a different run-up. Uh, as you know, some tracks, I mean, they'll run the same distance on the same day with 300-foot run-up for one race and 20 for another. So you just kind of have to deal with those things. But the good thing is uh, it's it's all done by computer programs I've written where those the times that we get are compared to what's been run on those tracks in the past. So... Uh, you know, I'm not really too concerned if it's totally accurate as long as it's consistent. If it's inaccurate, as long as it's consistently inaccurate, I'm fine with that. Uh, but what happens is when I, those times are converted to numbers, ones that just don't make any sense, when they, you know, instead of seeing, a, say, a 48 half and a 110 six furlongs, you might think in your head, ah, that seems a little fishy. When you see it as a pace figure and it's, you know, 60 and then the second pace figure is 110 and the next one goes back to 70 that sends a flag up every time and I'll go watch the replay and nine times out of ten either the timer malfunctioned or the the chart caller just fat fingered the time into the chart wrong or yeah I would say almost always anytime I see something like that there was an error I mean it's usually something fishy happened but it's the numerical thing that makes it jump out more than just the raw time so you have an ability to hand time or use video editing software. I'm, I'm just a little bit curious about how you come up with the corrected times in those instances where it's uh, clearly messed up. Well, when it comes to fractions, that's tough. I do have video uh, software that I can use to time the races, and it's really easy at the finish line. But it's not so easy because of the angles that are used for pace calls and it's not even consistent race to race. It just depends how the cameraman feels that day, I guess, what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> so fractions, generally, if there's a mistake and I can't fix it, if it's a timer malfunction, I leave it blank. I don't try to make a number. If it's just a fat finger by the chart caller, uh, I'll fix it myself and just use, use the one that was on the video screen 
and nearly every time when I plug that in, it works. It fits perfectly in. You know, it's usually not the uh, a malfunction. It was just an error with the chart. Uh, so yeah, it's just you know, it's one of those over experience. Uh, just doing so many of these every single day, I actually have my program spits out, hey, go go check this race because something's fishy here, and you know, it, it's it definitely helps. I mean, it gets a lot of figures right. Uh, that would otherwise go unnoticed, and I have a good team. I have David Aragona in New York, who's who's good. He'll point some out to me before I even have a chance to look and tell me, hey, something's fishy with this one. And you know, most of the time he's right. So we have a, a bunch of good guys out there helping me out. Uh, it's terrific. Important uh, to have a a good team when it comes to putting out uh, the best products. Uh, that that's for sure. We know we know all about that at DRF uh, for sure. Mike, did you have some specific questions for Craig? Do we want to move on to one of these other races? Where do you think we should go from here? We've got uh, about 20 minutes left. I do have a few questions that I want to cover, but I think we can uh, we can do them organically, taking a look at some other races. I know we want to look at the ninth race at Gulfstream today, which is a race that, uh, unlike the eighth, is is one that uh, you project or your, your algorithm projects to favor horses on or near the lead. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about that and talk about how uh, it doesn't seem like there are any scratches yet, but this um, the, the the time form USPPs do get updated uh, based on scratches and based on changes and MTOs drawing in and uh, also eligibles drawing in. Talk about that a little bit and how you factor that in both prior to and after scratches. Right. Okay. So when a race is drawn, as you say, sometimes you get MTOs for turf races or you get awful, also eligibles for a, a big field. And the way our pace projector and our power picks and such handle it is we basically ignore those horses until such time as they were to draw into the race. Uh, MTOs are also eligible as they draw in. They would then be incorporated into the pace projector and into the power picks. Uh, any scratched horses are removed. Uh, we don't actually remove their pace, pace, uh, past performances, but we put a line through them, so they're obviously scratched. And uh, you can see this if you're playing during the day and you have your screen open and you're doing PPs and there's a late scratch at the gate. I mean, it might take 30 seconds for it to refresh, but it will adjust on the fly. That's pretty cool. And you can see what a great uh, tool that would be, again, thinking specifically of, of tournament players here to be able to uh, get that new information automatically updated after scratches. This is an interesting right. situation, Craig, I want to ask you about in the pace projector here, where we have a, a slow pace projected, but yet we have three horses so close to one another um, towards the lead. In your estimation, which horse is, is favored here? Do, do you automatically just go with the number five because uh, Focus on Me has the highest number, or are there other factors you look at in that situation? Yeah, no, I would never just automatically go with the five in a spot like that. I mean, if only racing were that easy, right? We'd all we'd all be rich somehow, and until we, until we all figured it out, then we'd all be back in the same boat. But, uh, now, what what that's telling us here is there's not a lot of speed in this race, and, and on the preview page you can see that. Uh, one of the things I'll just touch on lightly is on the preview page you can see we gave this race rating a uh, this race a rating of 113 kind of almost like what we expect for the race and yet the early speed horses the highest you're going to see in here is a 107 on the five horse so that's telling us right there yeah this horse is you know he may be the fastest of this group but he's not really a speed horse he's not a horse that we're looking to go out and try to try to set the pace so we're, we're just telling you here that you know these are three horses in a race that doesn't have a lot of speed they're the ones that have shown the most and maybe we'll have an advantage over the rest of the field. And from there, you just kind of go on and, you know, just take that as a, I consider it a secondary factor when it comes to horse racing. I'm still looking at who's the best overall horse. And when I think it's close, you know, the odds, of course, are important, but the pace projector is kind of a tiebreaker. You know, maybe if it came down to the seven and the three, and I thought they were really even horses and they looked about the same on ability, and they're the same odds, I'm going to go with the seven every time based on the pace projector. That makes sense. Do you have any further thoughts on Gulfstream's ninth race to share? Uh, you know, the seven's a horse I kind of like just because he's coming off third start off a layoff. He, his figures have improved the first two times out. And again, that eight to, more, eight to one morning line, uh, I'm not sure we'll get that, but 
he was the one that interested me most. I am, despite being a speed figure guy, I'm also kind of a form cycle guy. I like looking at where horses are in their form cycle, and speed figures are a part of that. Uh, they're not all of it, but they're a big part of it. And you know, trainers, days off. I mean, you got to be comprehensive, in my opinion. Just because I make speed figures, people have this misconception that I live and die with numbers and. You know, racing doesn't work like that. It's a complicated game, which is probably why most of us love it so much. And you know, you have to consider everything. We've had a couple questions from the audience about the check marks. I'll go back to the preview screen where you can see the check marks for all of the runners. And I'm I'm assuming that these check marks are what drive the power picks here. Run for logistics is on top, and the power picks has five checks is the only one in the field with those. Talk a little bit about how those are earned. Um, and to, to what extent is that just an automated um, figure? Do you have any ROI or any, any sort of results information about uh, those check marks and how they relate to picking a winner? Uh, not to put you on the spot, but you're probably asking the wrong guy about that. <laughs> I, I know that they are the power, you know, they are used for the power picks. The, the most check marks will always be on top. I assume that they use the, I know they use the speed figures and the spotlight rating, but that's about it. I didn't have a lot to do with designing them, and I, to be honest, I, I don't even really look at them. It does, it does appear to be, just looking at Run for Logistics, for instance, this is a race where you've got the pace projector to, to favor those on or near the lead, has a relatively, compared to the others in the field, relatively high early speed figure and has the top spotlight, so that seems like that combined, those three pieces of data would make sense as to why Run for Logistics gets the, the, the top pick in here. Oh, like, definitely. I, mean, I have, Yeah, no doubt. I'm sure that's the reason. I just don't know the specifics of what go into the check marks. I mean, I know roughly it's speed figures, it's spotlight figure, gets a little more weight, than, gets more weight than the other speed figures. Uh, I'm not, I think trainer and jockey go into that, or not jockey, I definitely trainer, I'm not sure about jockey. Uh, and probably, a little, like you said, a little pace projector, but if you ask me the exact formula, I couldn't tell you. Here's one, Craig, I think that'll be more in your, your wheelhouse. Uh, it, it came in from, uh, from a, somebody who just uh, shot me a text, and it's about getting back to the question of these late pace figures in the running style. How does that single number relate to the five numbers in a row we were looking at before in the running line. How is that, uh, wh what is that derived from? Is that, my, my head, I would be guessing it would be something, my head it goes back to, to Sarton, something like sustained pace in the Sarton methodology where you're looking, or, or, or late pace in Sarton, where you're looking at the number sort of from the pace call to the end of the race. Which numbers does that encapsulate, and, and can you tell us a little more about how those numbers are created? Sure. It's, as you say, it's looking at the last five races, and it's looking at how fast the horse finishes, but it's also looking at it in relation to how fast it went early. So, you know, if, if they walk on the lead and they all fly home, then you don't get as much, uh, as much credit. It's also looking at pace posi uh, position early. Uh, a horse who leads and flies home is not going to get a very high rating. We look at that as being a front runner that got a very favorable trip. We don't want to look at him as, hey, this horse is a great closer. Because next out, yeah, we see it every now and then a horse can adapt and change. But for the most part, a horse who leads in a slow fractions and wins a race isn't suddenly going to be eighth next time and come flying at the end. Uh, and the other thing we're looking at is, or, and it kind of relates to that, is is the horse actually passing anyone? Uh, you know, in races, we don't want to, yeah, they may be coming home fast because the pace was slow and they're all running home fast, but if they're not passing anybody, they probably weren't really accomplishing much, and we don't want to benefit them with a big rating saying, hey, you know, this horse was, was some big closer when, in fact, he just followed everybody home. I imagine it varies based on distance, but how much ground typically is that late uh, pace rating covering? Is it the last two furlongs, the last four? Yeah, it just depends on the distance of the race. We, we go from the uh, second call, uh, the official second call, which can vary. You know, it's four furlongs for sprints. So if you, or I should say it's, it, it can vary. It's three furlongs at five furlongs. But just for typical distances, say six furlongs, it would be the last two. 
at a mile, it's the last two. At a mile and a quarter, I, let's say at a mile and an eighth, it's the last three furlongs because we get a six furlong call and a, the finish. And then when you start getting into longer distances, it gets a little tricky. Like a mile and a quarter, a lot of people don't know the actual official second call is a mile call, not the three quarters. So we're back to only looking at the last two furlongs for those races. So the second call to the end and the early number from the start to the second call. That's that's accurate, right? Right. And, and sometimes people get confused because, you know, you, you guys have been around a while. You probably remember the old days where you only got three calls in the past performances. <laughs> the, you know, now you get every two furlongs. If it's in, you know, it could be an 18 furlong race, it seems. They just stretch it off the end of the page and give us all the calls. But <laughs> that's when I talk official first and second call, I'm thinking back to the old days and you know that that's all we got was the first call and the, and the second and the finish maybe a, and a stretch call mixed in that was it let me ask you another quick hopefully question about uh, another number that appeared there that we hadn't had a chance to to talk about um, the the race rating that you see up top in the in the last example it was a, a white square with a 113 in it uh, what what is that race rating indicating like that's kind of indicating what we think it'll take to win the race today. It's not necessarily, a lot of people ask me, is that a par for the race? It's it's not a par. Uh, I've kind of gotten away from even talking about pars because it's just so hard these days with so many different race conditions. And, you know, you could spend 10 years trying to come up with a decent sample and, and still not have it for most of the conditions. So what we're telling you is we expect it's going to take at least a 113 to win the race today. Uh, so as you look at the horses, you might want to say, hey, has this horse run it before, or do I think it's capable in the case of, you know, a lightly raced horse or a, a horse that's changing connections. Maybe they haven't ran it before, but you have reason to believe they can today. So, uh, is it, but is it based I find it pretty on effective in eliminating horses, you know. if it's, That makes sense. It's, Similar it's, to the buyer based, par then, huh? Yeah, yeah, very much. Except, like I said, it's based on today's field hmm. more than anything, you know, any kind of real par number, but use it similarly, I would say. It, and that's what I was going to ask. Is it created in isolation of the class condition? In other words, only about the horses in today's race, or is there any combination of the two? No, it's just the horses in today's race. Makes sense. Mike, you wanted to demonstrate something about the race finder? Well, yeah, the race finder is, is a pretty neat feature, and, and if you're a certain type of handicapper, let's say you want uh, all turf allowance races, you could go to the race finder, pick your day, pick uh, whatever criteria you want and pull up all the races that meet the criteria. So here I'm looking at just any turf or synthetic graded or ungraded stakes for Saturday and we see there's five in the, in the country. And that's pretty cool. If you're, if you're a handicapper that wants to focus on the biggest races, you can use a tool like this to jump right in. And I know we do want to talk about the ninth at Gulfstream, which is actually a stakes race. So uh, I kind of killed two birds with one stone here. This is the an oh, easy sure. way to find that race. So let's let's jump straight to it, Craig. Um, one other thing I know uh, the Timeform US PPs have that we don't have in the DRF PPs is a lot of additional information about foreign horses. Uh, and in this race at Gulfstream on Saturday, Fields of Song is making. Uh, a debut in North America was for her first race in North America um, and had raced in uh, England prior, you get a lot more information here than you would in, say, the DRF PPs, right? Yeah, you do. You get, Of course, they don't have running lines overseas uh, like we're used to seeing. So in their place, we kind of put the expanded comment from the time form uh, correspondent on the track which can, if you read through them, or sometimes, I mean, it's a good full long paragraph of detailed information about the race that day and also maybe what they think's you know, going forward, maybe what they've done in the past. Uh, it just depends how, you know, what, how the guy felt about the horse that day, but you can find some really good nuggets of information on there when you click on it and expand what they had to say. And you can also see information about post and field size, and I think there's blinker information in there too, when when appropriate as well. So right, absolutely, some extra some extra stuff to help evaluate foreign runners, which can obviously be put to good use, especially when you're looking at figures that are on the exact same scale. Uh, what else did we want to show about this race at Gulfstream? 
Uh, I think that was the main thing. Just um, you know, we can. I, I don't know if we need to go to the show the DRF PPs. I think a lot of people are familiar with those time form notes. We now have time form UK ratings in the DRF PPs. The time form, the ratings in the time form US PPs are slightly different from what you see there. Mention that and talk a little bit about why they might be different from what we show in the DRF ones. Sure. Uh, time form in England. They use what they call wait for age ratings. Uh, so, you know, what you'll see is a two-year-old that wins a grade one may get ratings that look like what you'd see of a typical grade one winner for older horses. Uh, but since our goal here was to make our figures comparative to, you know, shippers to time form U.S. figures, uh, we remove that wait for age part. So when a two-year-old ships in, you're going to see what we think the horse actually ran speed-wise as opposed to what it's projected to run when it reaches peak maturity, which is that's great. That's a huge kind of what the weight for age thing. So if you look at, at the uh, the DRF PPs, you're going to see that that uh, weight for age rating uh, added into it, that component added in. So it's generally going to be higher. Uh, now that's for younger horses, two, three, and even somewhat into the four-year-old year, I believe. Uh, after that, for older horses, they should be approximately the same. Uh, depending on the settings and time form USPPs, you can make an adjustment for weight or not. So that might sway at a few points. But uh, just so people aren't confused if they're looking at both sets and they say, hey, wait, this foreign shipper has a 90 here, but 105 in DRF. That's the reason why. It has is to do worse. Is there a way, Craig, to strip out the weight completely from the from the time form figs? I, I thought it was maybe too uh, integral to to take it out totally, but it sounds like maybe you can. Oh yeah, you can if you if you click on any of the pace uh, running lines on any of the horses. Uh, of course, that won't work for a European horse. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to change your general settings, if you click on the pace figures, it's going to bring up a preferences window, and the very first one you see is weight on or weight off. If you select weight off, it's gone. You won't see any adjustments for weight. Gotcha. All right. Let's. Uh, we got about three or four minutes left. Uh, let's send it to a couple other questions from the audience. Mike, I could talk for another hour, but we won't make everybody uh, endure <laughs> that. We'll we'll come back at another time for some more of my personal questions. But uh, what else do we have from the crowd? Uh, well, Scott Carlson wants to know um, about the differences. In, in you notice, sometimes there's a P or a B next to some of the race ratings. Um, can you explain what those mean? Ah, yes, I can explain what those mean. <laughs> uh, I don't know all the codes off the top of my head, but if you look in the timeformusblog.com, you'll be able to find it. Uh, and what that is, is when I had trouble or thought there was very little information as far as making a speed figure, that's our way of letting you know, hey, this isn't a figure we have 100% confidence in. Uh, it doesn't mean it's wrong by any means, but it means, hey, that, you know, there's some question marks here. It could have been that there's a, a fast, fast track turned sloppy for the last race. It could be there was only one turf race on the whole day. You know, it could be there was only one sprint race and it was maiden, all first time starters, uh, something like that. So the codes actually mean something. And there's about seven or eight of them you can find in the blog piece that'll tell you exactly what they are. But you know, I think what we're telling you is is if you may not want to bet a favorite off a big speed figure if he has one of those codes next to it because it's a little bit, you know, questionable. Absolutely. We, we have another question from Sheldon Usprek. Hopefully I'm not butchering your name, Sheldon. Um, he wants to know what this number next to the date signifies uh, and does it relate to any of the numbers in the pace or, or final speed figure? Yes, that's actually the race rating. The same as the one we talked about earlier where we were predicting a 113, that's telling you actually what it turned out to be, what we're gotcha. rating that race. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, all right. A, a, a couple people oh, one have other said... One note on that. Oh, go ahead. Often, uh, at times, you will see that shaded in either red or blue, and that's where we're telling you, hey, this track may have been biased that day, whereas red means... Front runners did a lot better than we expected, and blue means front runners did a lot worse than expected. Uh, so the, those are days when I see those when I will definitely dig through the charts and kind of look at the day and see what happened. I, I don't like saying it's a, a bias code, you know, indicate yes, it was a speed bias, because I, I just think it's a lot more complicated subject than that. 
But yeah, there's an example of that 71 in red uh, that you just scrolled through. We're saying, hey, speed did really, really well that day. Mm -hmm. That let's talk about that again. So that race is that number, that race rating, is that what was let's use the October twenty sixth, seventy one as an example. Is that what the winning figure was of that race, or is that what it was projected to be before the race was run? It's done after the race. We don't use the one that we put in before. Uh, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, but the one after is based on, I believe it's the top five finishers in the race. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So it's not just the same as the winner. It's an average. Okay, that makes sense. Right. Uh, so like Arrogant won the Travers with a 139 or 137 or whatever it was. That rating's not going to be 137 because the rest of the field was so far behind it. You know, it may have been 115. I don't remember what it was off the top of my head. But the de facto it class rating. was at the top five, yes. Gotcha. One quick more from the crowd, Mike. We'll keep people two minutes extra, and then we'll let everybody uh, get back to work. Oh, well, we'll just end it with uh, Stuart Dangerfield said, um, you probably need to do a part two. Well, I, I think we're going to do a part two, part three, part four. I hope we'll be doing uh, <laughs> some of these regularly, diving more deeply into some of the different features, because there's a lot to cover in here. Um, so, and I'll also jump back to our offer um, to try out Timeform USPPs. You get two days of unlimited Timeform USPPs for just $2.99. Um, this is the link. Uh, you'll also, everyone that registered, everyone that attended will get an email that will have this link to it. Try it. You can try it uh, Friday and Saturday. You can try it Saturday and Sunday. Uh, whenever you want, you can save it for the next big day that you're going to focus on or next big weekend you're going to focus on. But note, uh, can only be used once per customer uh, for this remarkable offer. A final right. quick you question. Say, oh, you got something on that, Craig? Yeah, I was just going to say when you say two days, that's every track that's running that day. Correct. Yes. Excellent. A uh, quick final question from listener Jonathan Kinchin. He wants to know, Craig, Kevin Durant or Russell Westbrook? Oh, Russell Westbrook. He, he's my... I don't want to say hero. I'm too old to have heroes, but he's, <laughs> I only hope I can work as hard every day as he does on the basketball court. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank Craig Mokowski for joining us. First visit of many between these handicapping sessions and the podcast. I want to thank Mike Hogan for doing such a great job putting this webinar, this handicapping session together, as he always does. I want to thank all of you for listening. It's been a lot of fun. If you want to refer back to any of the information here, you can do so on the DRF YouTube channel. That's drf.com slash YouTube. If you want more from us, we'll be back with a podcast tomorrow and more in the future. You've been watching a handicapping session produced by drf.com.